Good morning! Wow! I always love the enthusiastic response at English service. How's everyone doing this morning? You ready to hear God's word? Yes! Woohoo! I'm pumped up also. Okay, so today we are carrying on in our series of 1 Samuel. Before we jump into 1 Samuel chapter 3, which is our passage for this morning, I thought it would be important if we do a recap of where we are in the story, in case some of you never come to church, <laughs> okay? Uh, or for some of our teens who are joining us uh, today from the teen service, where we are in the story. Um, so 1 Samuel is actually about Samuel, obviously, okay, but it begins with his mother, Hannah, and she is not able to have any children. So what she does is she goes to the house of the Lord to pray and she asks for a son. And in her prayer, right, she promises that if God were to give her a son, she will then give this son back to serve the Lord. So she's there in the temple and she's praying. And as she's praying, Eli, who is a priest, he sees her praying and then after that, he blesses her. He says, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. Okay, so Hannah goes back. And after some time, yay! She has a baby, right? She gives birth to a son and she calls him Samuel. And as promised, she gives Samuel to the Lord. She said, I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He shall be given over to the Lord. I just want to pause for a moment and say, right, that this woman is amazing. Okay, extraordinary faith and obedience. How many of us, right, after finally getting something that you have wanted for a really, really, really long time, then you are able to take this thing that you really, really desire and give it up just like that. Amazing woman of God, and she's honored in the Bible. The Bible captures her prayer in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. And this is a prayer that actually is very strikingly similar uh, to the prayer that Mary, mother of Jesus, prays when she finds out that she's pregnant with the Messiah. So these women have a lot of similarities. Uh, okay, so then Samuel is given to serve the Lord, and he serves in the house of the Lord under the guidance of Eli, the priest. Unfortunately, Eli's house is a mess, all right? In chapter 2, we, is it chapter 2? Yes, chapter 2, we see that Eli's sons were scoundrels. Say with me, scoundrels. <laughs> okay, now I say one, ah. the Bible say one. Okay, they had no regard for the Lord. They stole offerings that were meant for God. They had sex with the women who were serving in the house of the Lord. They abused their spiritual authority for their own gain. So they were scoundrels. And um, although Eli hears of this, he hears that his two sons are doing bad things and he tries to stop them, but his sons continue. And so, of course, God is angry and he cuts Eli's house off. All right, God says, let me tell you, uh, God tells, well, God uses somebody else to tell Eli. He says that I promise before before all of this happened, I promised that the members of your family would minister before me forever. So actually God had favour upon Eli's house. But because of what they had done, said, God said, your family has dishonoured me, so therefore all the people in your house will be cursed to die at a young age. The two sons who had sinned against God, Hopni and Phineas, they will both die on the same day and his whole family, Eli's whole family will be cut off. So that was God's judgment upon Eli's house. But God said, I will continue to protect Israel and I will raise up for myself another faithful priest. Okay, so this is what has happened in the first two chapters of Samuel, in case you missed it. This is a very messy time for Israel. Right, we're still in the time of judges. A king has not been appointed yet. And there's religious corruption among those who are supposed to be the spiritual leaders. And there's political danger also because there's um, Israel continues to be threatened by many other nations. And it is in this context that we come to 1 Samuel chapter 3. And unfortunately, the chapter starts with a very depressing declaration. It says, In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. And that is a very, very sad thing. Okay, for a nation that is meant to take its direction and leadership from God, it is very concerning that they cannot hear from Him. 
If they are supposed to take direction and leadership from him and they cannot hear from him, then where are they supposed to go? Right? So it is a very messy time in Israel. And in this messy time, a boy Samuel hears the voice of God. So I invite you now to take out your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3. It's not going to appear on the screen, so you're going to need your Bibles. 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel comes before 2 Samuel. And chapter 3 comes after chapter 1 and chapter 2. Okay, open your Bibles. And you can follow along with me as I read it for us. Before we do that, of course, we always want to pray. So come, let us close our eyes and commit this time to the Lord. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Truly, it is a privilege. Today, we want to remember that there were times where your word was rare, where people could not have access to your word. So God, it's our privilege to be able to approach your holy scripture this morning. Lord, may you open our eyes to see as you see, open our ears that we may hear from you, and open our hearts to receive your word. Come, Holy Spirit, and speak to us. Help us to be attentive to your voice. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. First Samuel chapter 3. So the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back. And lie down. So Samuel went and lay down. And again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin that he knew about his sons uttered blasphemies against God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and he was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son, Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything that he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. And Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. 
And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And this is the story we will be approaching this morning. Now, I want to ask, how many of you have heard the voice of God before? Anybody heard the voice of God before? Yeah, okay, cool. So I love to talk to people to find out more about how God speaks to them because I find that our stories are all so varied and different, right? Some people, they receive God's word through an audible voice that they can hear. Some people have dreams or they see visions. Um, The most common way that uh, all of us hear God's word or hear God's voice is, of course, through the divine scripture, the Bible. But then some of us also receive God's word through feelings, emotions, sensations in our body, promptings. Uh, It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. But in our story today, Samuel receives God's word through an audible voice while he is sleeping in the house of the Lord. But don't sleep, okay? Please don't sleep in the house of the Lord this morning. Samuel was sleeping because it was at night and he hears God through an audible voice. Now, while not all of us will hear God through an audible voice, I think this story still gives us some handles on how we can develop our ability to hear God's word and to speak God's word. Okay, and we'll look at four of those things that this story teaches us today. So one of the first things that we notice about this story is that just because you are familiar with God's presence does not mean that you will be familiar with God's voice, okay? Scripture tells us that the boy Samuel, he grew up in the presence of the Lord. Wow, this one is very privileged, okay? To grow up in the presence of the Lord and he ministered before the Lord under Eli. But yet, in verse 7, it says that Samuel did not know the Lord because the word of the Lord has not yet been revealed to him. So being in God's presence does not automatically mean that you are able to hear and identify God's voice. Okay, he, Samuel lived in the house of the Lord. He served in the house of the Lord. He even slept where the ark of God was. He literally slept in the presence of God. And yet, when God called out to him, Samuel, Samuel, he did not recognize God's voice. Now, of course, if you're not even in God's presence, then forget, forget about it. You definitely won't hear God's voice. Lah. But because being in God's presence does increase our chances of hearing God, right? It helps us to become more familiar with how God feels like. But there does seem to be an extra step that's required before one can hear and recognize God's voice. So, At this point, I want to emphasize again, all right, that different people experience God differently uh, and therefore we interact and converse with Him differently because each of us are unique individuals. All of us are different. We have different ways of communicating. We have different ways of feeling. And God Himself is also a person with His own unique character. So each of us experience God's presence and therefore hear God's voice differently from one another. I would like to introduce you guys to this crew.org article. It's called How Your Personality Connects with God. I'm not going to go into it in great detail because you can simply Google and read later, okay? It describes nine different ways that we can interact with God. For example, uh, you might be a naturalist, right? You experience God best out in nature. When you are in the world that God created, then you connect best with God. Now, in different seasons, I think we can be all nine of these things, but in different seasons, I prefer to interact with God in different ways. Uh, But in this moment, uh, I was reflecting in preparing for this sermon. I think I tend towards experiencing God through caregiving. So I love God by loving people. I feel close to God when I'm serving others. Uh, And lately, also because I have to prepare a lot of sermons lately, so I'm also re-engaging, experiencing God as an intellectual, right? I engage Him with my mind, I want to study, I want to learn new things about God. So these are different ways that we engage with God's presence. And as we engage with God's presence, we, we become more and more familiar with His voice. So what I want, right, is to really encourage all of you to explore and discover the ways that you feel most comfortable interacting with God. And through that, you spend more time in His presence. And over time, you develop familiarity with how it feels like to be with Him. And then slowly, slowly, you develop a familiarity of how His voice might sound like. 
Okay, so how your, personality, how your personality connects you with God is a crew.org article. All right, so the first thing we learn is that uh, God's presence, we need to be in God's presence in order to hear His voice. And the second thing that this story teaches us about how to hear God's word is that we need to remove the barriers. Now, verse 1, it says, In those days, the word of the Lord was rare and there were not many visions. Uh, the Hebrew phrase, right, for there were not many visions actually can be literally translated as no vision was able to break through. No vision was able to break through. And this is really interesting to me because this suggests, right, that God didn't stop sending visions. God continued to send visions. God continued to try and send His word to the people, but somehow these visions were not able to reach the people. Somehow there were barriers blocking the visions from breaking through. You know, now more than ever, right, we are assured of God's presence with us. Okay, in Old Testament times, maybe a bit hard to say, okay, because God's Spirit was only given to selected people. But in our current times, post-Jesus, glory, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit is given to all. The Holy Spirit is poured, about, poured out upon all flesh. So we know that God is always with us. We know that God is always interacting with us, trying to speak to us, trying to reach out to us. So, if you do not hear Him, if you do not feel Him, perhaps it is worth it to reflect and consider, is there anything that might be getting in the way? Now, in Samuel's time, one of the obvious barriers was corruption among the religious leaders, right? The priests, these are the ones who are supposed to be taking care of God's house. These are the ones who are supposed to be ushering God's presence uh, and they're supposed to be channels of God's word to the people. These very leaders were scoundrels and they were corrupt. And so, of course, no vision was able to break through. Their sin, their corruption, their abuse of power, they were blocking God's word. Now, instead of looking at other people, at this point, let us consider ourselves. It is very possible that our own sin, our own corruption, our abuse of our own power, our refusal to honour God, our own pride, it is possible that we have put up barriers that might be preventing us from hearing, hearing God's voice. Barriers that are preventing God's word from breaking through to reach us. Because I have a firm belief that God is faithful, that God is always speaking, that God is always trying to connect with you. It's just a matter of whether we have ears to hear Him or not. Now, the third thing that this story teaches us about how to hear and speak God's word. Let's read the bottom part together. We need, ready? One, two, three. We need the help of our community. We need to read it because we are community. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Again, uh, one, two, three. We need the help of our community. Now, this part I really love and appreciate about the story, uh, but this is because I'm a fairly typical Christian mil millennial. <laughs> I place a strong emphasis on Christian community. I believe that none of us are meant to exist as, as individuals. Uh, I believe that Christian community is more than just this gathering of 1.5 hours uh, on a Sunday morning, right? I believe in the responsibility of the Christian community to nurture, care for, sharpen, and develop every single member of the body. So, it excites me to see that in this story, in order to properly hear and discern God's word, we need one another. Because Samuel, he could not have heard God's word without the help of Eli, right? We saw, um, first of all, that the only reason Samuel could be in God's presence is that he was serving together with Eli. So that allowed him to be in God's presence often. And then it was also Eli who realised that the Lord was calling him. I mean, God called Samuel three times left. And he's still like, huh? What, what's happening? <laughs> okay, to be fair, he's just a small boy at the time, so we shall not judge him. But Samuel did not know and likely would not have known that it was God unless Eli told him. Right? The, the scripture tells us very clearly that Samuel did not yet know the Lord. He was so young. So it was Eli who pointed out that it was God. 
And of course, it was Eli who instructed Samuel how to respond. Right? He told Samuel to, te- to say, uh, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And it is because of this, without Eli's help, Samuel would never have been able to recognize God's voice or to receive God's word. Now, I also want us to remember, right, that all of this is happening in light of what already happened in chapter 1 and chapter 2. What happened in chapter 2? Remember in the recap just now? God already tell Eli, you're done. You and your house, your family are being ousted. Okay, so Eli already knows that a major transition is about to happen. Eli knows that he's on his way out. And yet, Eli is not defensive or insecure. He understands the role he has to play as an aging priest. He's old. He's losing his eyesight. And here we see a wonderful model of leadership transition and intergenerational relationship. Eli knows that he's going to get kicked out very soon. But he is not threatened by the rise of a new leader who could potentially take his place. He does not put in place any barriers to Samuel's development. In fact, he teaches, he guides him, he passes on the skills that are necessary for Samuel to fulfill his role. Eli knows his time is up and he accepts it gracefully. Of course, Eli is not perfect, right? He has, to, he has um, to a certain extent, failed to raise up his sons in the ways of the Lord, but God is gracious and Eli gets another chance with Samuel. And so with this boy, Eli tries again. Samuel may be the main character in the story, but Samuel cannot become who he is meant to become without the help of Eli, his spiritual father, his mentor, his predecessor. We need one another. And the older generation has a responsibility to teach the younger generation how to hear God's voice. You know, I cannot be who I am today without the guidance and communal discernment of this community. I have been really blessed to be the recipient of godly guidance and counsel from my biological parents as well as my many spiritual parents right here in this congregation. My peers, my fellow leaders, my co-workers, we communally discern together the direction of God for the ministry. Sometimes it is hard to hear God's voice. Sometimes we think we hear our but then the word like very weird like, <laughs> or it's very difficult. Sometimes we're not sure if it's really from God or not. But if our community is safe, then we can help one another to discern this. My dear brothers and sisters, we are all part of this community, this family, this body. And learning to hear God's voice, to discern God's word, to clarify our calling, all of these things must happen within the context of community. We cannot be solo warriors. And it is my sincere prayer that this family church will be a safe space where communal discernment of God's will can happen together, where generations will teach generations. To learn to hear and speak God's word, we need the help of community. And the fourth thing this story teaches us about how to hear and speak God's word is that we need to be obedient. All right, first, you need a posture of obedience. If you are even going to be able to hear God's word in the first place, you need a posture of obedience, right? Eli tells Samuel to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. He used the word Lord and servant, right? It's an acknowledgement that God is our Lord and Master and we are his servants. So we are subject to his will and we will obey his will. Uh, This is similar to the point earlier where we need to remove barriers, right? Pride, self-sufficiency, thinking that I am the master of my own life. These are all barriers that prevents God's word from breaking through. And so obedience tears down that barrier so that you can hear from God. And so you approach God with a a posture of obedience, only then can you hear. And then once you have received God's word, you also need to respond in obedience, right? Again, Eli shows Samuel how to do this. Uh, because the word that Samuel receives is not the best, lah, okay? It pronounces judgment upon someone 
whom Samuel respects, who, someone whom Samuel serves and spends a lot of time with. And I guess Eli also can roughly guess that this word is not going to be good, right? Because God actually already told him before. Already. But even still, uh, amidst all of these things, he still instructs Samuel to just say it. Whatever God has given to you, you better say. In verse 17, he says, what, has, what was it that he said to you? Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so se severely, if you hide from me anything that he told you. Eli is telling Samuel, it's very dangerous huh? if you hear God's word and you are disobedient. It is dangerous. Once you have received it, you must obey. If God asks you to speak it, you better speak. So, now, right? Uh, okay, so Samuel said, okay, then I, I tell you what God said, okay? <laughs> but I can imagine he's trembling and scared and not sure how Eli will react, right? Okay, I mean, he's, he's scared to offend. He's just a young boy standing before this guy, right? Scared that now he knows this big secret that perhaps he's not supposed to know. Okay, we know what's going on. We know what Eli's sons did. But Samuel might not have known, you know? And God just told him, your leader is going to die because he was not faithful. So this young boy is like, okay, let me tell you now that God told me that you are not a good leader. <laughs> and God told me that you are going to be destroyed and it is the end of your leadership. Yo, it is not easy to be a messenger of God's word. It's even more not easy when it's bad news. It's super duper not easy when the one you have to tell this bad news is your boss. Hello, boss. God asked me to tell you that you are wrong, okay? <laughs> He's going to destroy you soon. Okay, very scary. But Eli says, no, you just, just tell me, just tell me. Okay, so Eli, so Samuel tells Eli, and I really have to hats off to this guy. Again, he's not perfect. Okay? He made a lot of mistakes. He didn't control his sons. But after Samuel, with fear and trembling, tells Eli this bad news, right? In response to this, Eli says only one thing. He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. This information about judgment is not new to Eli, actually. He, someone else already warned him that this was coming. So this word from Samuel is just a confirmation, just a confirmation. It's still bad when you hear it a second time that God is confirmed going to kill you and your family. Um, but I think what is really, what I imagine what would have been really hard for Eli is that this word is coming from the mouth of someone so young and insignificant. It's a bit shameful to let this kid know that do let your disciple know that your life is a mess, maybe. And it also signals to Eli that it's quite likely that Samuel is the one who will replace him, right? Because now God's word is coming to this kid instead of me. So in light of all these things, right? In light of the severity of the message, in light of the imminent end of his career as a priest, in light of God choosing this random kid over him, Eli says, you know what? He's the Lord. God is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. For those of you who have tried to tell your bosses bad feedback before, sometimes they will scold you, <laughs> right? But not in Eli's case. He says, you know what? God is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. And so through his example, he shows Samuel, first you need a posture of obedience to hear. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And then once we have received God's word, then we need to respond in obedience. If God asks you to speak it, you speak it. And once God has spoken it, you accept that God's will must be done and God's will will be done above all else. So Samuel learns obedience from Eli. And I also want to notice, right, in the story later that we see that actually this obedience continues throughout the rest of Samuel's life. Towards the end of chapter 3, and we'll see the rest of First and Second Samuel, actually. It says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, 
And God let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all of Israel from then to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear in Shiloh. And there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Because this first word that Samuel received, right, this word of judgment against Eli's family, it's not likely that this word was broadcasted to the whole of Israel, right? He just tell Eli and then that's the end of it. It was, after all, a word specifically for Eli and his family. But scripture tells us that as the years went by, as Samuel grew up, he received more and more words from God. So it was not a one-off thing. It started with this one message that he was supposed to tell Eli and that's it. But as he grew up, he received more and more words from God. And we don't know the content of them all, but what we do know is that the Lord continued to appear to Samuel and to reveal more of himself to him. And Samuel obediently continued. He continued to share that word to the people. He continued to obey God's word and continued to obey God's command to speak that word to the people. And as time passed, as Samuel grew up, we see the leadership transition taking place. It's not an immediate thing, but over time, as Samuel grew up, we see that all Israel, all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. As Samuel continued to be obedient to God's word, people could see that this is God's chosen leader. This is our next priest, our next prophet. And as he is obedient to God, we will be obedient to him. So to hear and speak God's word, we must be servants of God from beginning to the end. You must be a servant in order to hear you must be a servant in order to receive and you must be a servant continually if you want to keep being used by God. Now, as we wrap up the sermon for today, I would like to give us some time to reflect. At the start of this sermon, I asked, has anybody heard God's voice before? And I know most of us didn't raise our hand because maybe we have not heard God's audible voice. But that's okay because God speaks to us in many different ways. But even as we approach God and God's presence, I like for us to think, are we familiar with God's voice? If God spoke, would you even know that it was Him? Or you would just be like, huh? Who called me? Huh? Or you would respond to the wrong person as Samuel did, right? He thought it was Eli instead of God. Are you familiar with God's voice? If he spoke to you, would you know it was him? Do you spend time in his presence so you, can, you are familiar with how he feels and what he sounds like? Are there any barriers that are in the way? Because God is always speaking. It is sometimes our own issues that are blocking the word of God from reaching us. So are there any barriers in the way? In order to hear and speak God's word, we also need the help of our community, right? Particularly the help of those who have the benefit of more spiritual experience. Those who are a little bit more familiar with God's voice can help those who might be less familiar. And if you want to hear God's word and to keep hearing God's word and God's voice, you need to be obedient. We need to see God as our Lord and our Master and us as His servants. Let us spend a couple of minutes here in God's presence. I invite you to close your eyes. God desires to speak to each and every one. God desires for you to communicate with Him, to hear from Him. Do you recognize His presence right now here with you? The presence of our Lord and our King. He is here. Do you 
you feel him. and marvelous God, King of kings, Lord of lords, you are here. We are your people. We are your servants. God, we come before you. You are here. We are your servants, Lord. become familiar with God's voice. If you desire to hear Him, you know there are some barriers in the way. You know you need His help for obedience. If you desire to hear God's voice, He is here. I invite you to raise your hands to Him as an act of surrender, as an act of obedience. this church community that we may lay aside our pride that we may turn away from sin that we will come before you in obedience speak Lord your people are listening give us Lord a word for today Give us guidance and direction for tomorrow. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Lord, for each and every one of my brothers and sisters, Lord, I know and trust that your Holy Spirit walks with us every single day. So even as we go from here, speak, Lord, and help your people to listen. And as we receive your word, that your Holy Spirit would give us boldness and courage to obey. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. 
We thank God for His Word and for His presence. Shall we lift up a clap offering unto our King of Kings and Lord of Lords?